It's Monday, August 1st, 2022, 9.14 p.m. My name is Kessie Ian Anderson, and welcome back to another edition of Herezi Arc. Shoot him once. going to be focusing on it's called the green bomb speech that's just what kind of the nomenclature has established it to be is the green bomb speech of dc hammond that's not its official name when you talk to somebody if they know what you're talking about when you say the green bomb speech they go they know exactly what you're going into but it's actually hypnosis in mpd that's multi-personality disorder Ritual Abuse, D.C. Hammond, Ph.D., 1992. So this is from a gentleman named Peter Freyd from University of Pennsylvania, Monday, 7th of July, 1997. He has this little foreword talking about it. He goes, herein is the lecture of D.C. Hammond, originally entitled Hypnosis in MPD Ritual Abuse, but now usually known as the Greenbaum Speech delivered at the 4th Annual Eastern Regional Conference on Abuse and Multiple Personality, Thursday, June 25th, 1992, at the Radisson Plaza Hotel Mark Center, Alexandria, Virginia. Sponsored by the Center for Abuse Recovery and Empowerment, the Psychiatric Institute of Washington, D.C., both a tape and a transcript were at one time available from audio transcripts of Alexandria, Virginia, and then there's a number you can call, Tapes and transcripts of other sessions from the conference are still being sold, but, understandably, not this one. The transcript below is made from a privately made tape of the original lecture. The single most remarkable thing about this speech is how little one has heard of it in the two years since its original delivery. It is recommended that one reads far enough at least until one finds why it's called the Green Bomb speech. So this is going to be a little longer video because I'm going to read through this and I'm going to add in my own comments and commentary on my two cents as I go through it. But let's talk about this gentleman, D. Corridon Hammond. I guess, I don't know if I'm saying his name right, Corridon Hammond. Now this guy is not just some shill or schlub. This guy is very deep and well, well trained in his profession originally read through his credentials, but it's just too much. He's very credentialed. I'm just going to post it as a picture. So this was spoken in 1992. All right, so now I'm going to read the Green Bomb speech of D.C. Hammond. So here we go starting. We've got a lot to cover today, and let me give you a rough approximate outline of the things that I'd like us to get into. First, let me ask how many of you have had at least one course or workshop on hypnosis. Can I see the hands? Wonderful. That makes our job easier. Okay, I want to start off by talking a little about trance training and the use of hypnotic phenomena with an MPD, dissociative disorder population. To talk some about unconscious exploration, methods of doing that, the use of imagery and symbolic imagery techniques for managing physical symptoms, input overload, things like that. Before the day's out, I want to spend some time talking about something I think has been completely neglected in the field of dissociative disorder, and that's talking about methods of profound calming for automatic hyperarousal that's been conditioned in these patients. We're going to spend a considerable length of time talking about age regression and abreaction in working through a trauma. Now I'm going to stop right there. There's a term that he used, abreaction. So if anything I wasn't aware of, I'm going to look it up and then I'll tell you guys what it is as well. I'm going to define it. Abreaction. The expression and consequent release of previously repressed emotion achieved through reliving the experience that caused it, typically through hypnosis or suggestion. And here's an example. He was using dream abreaction to treat a schizoid patient. 
Here we go again. Every action is a psychoanalytical term for reliving an experience to purge it of its emotional excesses, a type of catharsis. Sometimes it is a method of becoming conscious of repressed traumatic events. That's Wikipedia. Again, now again, MPD, multi-personality disorder patient. So now jumping back in. I'll show you with a non-MPD patient some of that kind of work and then extrapolate from what I find so similar and different with MPD cases. Part of that, I would add, by the way, is that I've been very sensitive through the years about taping MPD cases or ritual abuse cases. Part of it being that some of that feels a little like using patients, and I think that this population has been used enough. That's part of the reason by choice that I don't generally videotape my work. I also want to talk a bunch about hypnotic relapse prevention strategies and post-integration therapy today. Finally, I hope to find somewhere in our time frame to spend an, an hour or so talking specifically about ritual abuse and about mind control programming and brainwashing, how it's done, how to get on the inside with that, which is a topic that in the past I haven't been willing to speak about publicly, have done that in small groups and in consultations, but recently decided that it was high time that somebody started doing it. So we're going to talk about specifics today. In Chicago, at the first International Congress where ritual abuse was talked about, I can remember thinking, how strange and interesting. I can recall many people listening to an example given that somebody thought was so idiosyncratic and rare, and all the people coming up after saying, gee, you're treating one too? You're in Seattle. Well, I'm in Toronto. Well, I'm in Florida. Well, I'm in Cincinnati. I didn't know what to think at that point. It wasn't too long after that I found my first ritual abuse patient in somebody I was already treating and we hadn't gotten that deep yet. Things in that case made me very curious about the use of mind control techniques and hypnosis and other brainwashing techniques. So I started studying brainwashing and some of the literature in that area and became acquainted with, in fact, one of the people who had written one of the better books in that area. Then I decided to do a survey and from the ISSMP and D International Society for the Study of Multiple Personality and Dissociation folks, I picked out about a dozen and a half therapists that I thought were seeing more of that than probably anyone else around, and I started surveying them. The interview protocol that I had got the same reaction almost without exception. Those therapists said, you're asking questions I don't know the answers to. You're asking more specific questions than I've ever asked my patients. Many of those same therapists said, let me ask those questions and I'll get back to you with the answer. Many of them not only got back with answers, but said, you've got to talk to this patient or these two patients. I ended up doing hundreds of dollars worth of telephone interviewing. What I came out of that was a grasp of a variety of brainwashing methods being used all over the country. I started to hear some similarities, whereas I hadn't known, to begin with, how widespread things were. I was now getting a feeling that there were a lot of people reporting some similar things and that there must be some degree of communication here. Then approximately two and a half years ago, I had some material drop in my lap. My source was saying a lot of things that I knew were accurate about some of the brainwashing, but it was telling me new material I had no idea about. At this point, I took and decided to check it out in three ritual abuse patients I was seeing at the time. Two of the three had what they were describing in careful inquiry without leading or contaminating. The fascinating thing was that as I did a telephone consult with a therapist that had been consulting for quite a number of months on an MPD case in another state, I told her to inquire about certain things. She said, well, what are those things? I said, I'm not going to tell you because I don't want there to be any possibility of contamination. Just come back to me and tell me what the patient says. She called me back two hours later, said, I just had a double session with this patient and there was a part of him that said, oh, we're so excited. If you know about this stuff, you know how the cult programmers get on the inside and our therapy is going to go so much faster. Many other patients since have had a reaction of wanting to pee their pants out of anxiety and fear rather than thinking it was a wonderful thing. But the interesting thing was that she then asked, she then asked, quote, what are these things? Unquote. They were word perfect. Same answers my source had given me. I've since repeated that in many parts of the country. 
I've consulted in 11 states and one foreign country, in some cases over the telephone, in some cases in person, in some cases giving the therapist information ahead of time and saying, be very careful how you phrase this. Phrase it in these ways so you don't contaminate. In other cases, not even giving the therapist information ahead of time so they couldn't, when you start to find the same highly esoteric information in different states and different countries from Florida to California, you start to get an idea that there's something going on that is very large, very well coordinated with a great deal of communication and systematicness to what's happening. So I have gone from someone kind of neutral and not knowing what to think about it all to someone who clearly believes ritual abuse is real and that the people who say it isn't are either naive like people who didn't want to believe the Holocaust or they're dirty. Now for a long time I would tell a select group of therapists that I knew and trusted information and say spread it out, don't spread my name, don't say where it came from, but here's some information. Share it with other therapists if you find it's on target and I'd appreciate your feedback. People would question in talks and say, you know, they were hungry for information. Myself, as well as a few others that I've shared it with, were hedging out of concern and out of personal threats and out of death threats. I finally decided to hell with them. If they're going to kill me, they're going to kill me. It's time to share more information with therapists. Part of that comes because we proceeded so cautiously and slowly checking things in many different locations and finding the same thing. So I'm going to give you the way in with ritual abuse programming. I certainly can't tell you everything that you want to know in 45 or 50 minutes, but I'm going to give you the essentials to get inside and start working at a new level. I don't know what proportion, honestly, of patients have this. I would guess that maybe somewhere around at least 50%, maybe as high as three quarters. I would guess maybe two thirds of your ritual abuse patients may have this. What do I think the distinguishing characteristics is? If they were raised from birth in a mainstream cult, or if they were a non-bloodline person, meaning neither parent was in the cult. But cult people had a lot of access to them in early childhood. They may also have it. I've seen more than one ritual abuse patient who clearly had all the kind of ritual things you hear about. They seemed very genuine. They talked about all the typical things that you hear in this population, but had none of this programming with prolonged extensive checking. So I believe in one case I was personally treating that she was a kind of schismatic breakoff that had kind of gone off and done their own thing and were no longer hooked into a mainstream group. Here's where it appears to have come from. At the end of World War II, before it even ended, Alan Dulles and people from our intelligence community were already in Switzerland making contact to get out Nazi scientists. As World War II ends, they not only get out rocket scientists, but they also get out some Nazi doctors who have been doing mind control research in the camps. All right, I'm going to stop right there for a moment. If you get a chance, there's a book you need to buy. It's called The Devil's Chessboard. It was written by a guy named David Talbot. He was the founder of Salon and author of the New York Times bestseller Brothers, an explosive headline-making portrait of Alan Dulles. So this book, The Devil's Chessboard, it's the full title, Devil's Chessboard, Alan Dulles, the CIA, and the Rise of America's Secret Government. This book is huge on giving you an underpinning background of how evil the CIA is. Mossad is basically the general manager of the CIA. Oh, there was, you tell the story about how you try to find out what the what they call the Mossad when they deal with uh, publicly? I thought it was a reasonable question, but the trouble is uh, you can't pick up the phone book. There's no uh, Langley in, the, in Israel that you can look up you know, CIA, or in our case, uh, the Mossad. We thought we should ask, what shall we call it in English? Which can translate the Hebrew words, as I said, Mossad is Institute. But when they write a letter to their friends in the CIA or the British intelligence, what do they call themselves? It took a while. Uh, it was a matter of asking the prime minister spokesman. The best you could do, because officially uh, the Mossad is under the prime minister's office. And uh, I think he sort of wondered why you want to know and all that, so we explained. And he came up with uh, the Israeli Secret Intelligence Service. I and mean, if it were to have initials, it would be ISIS. Just simple words like that. Interestingly enough, a kind of a British model. The British don't really like the names MI5 and MI6 for their foreign service. They prefer SIS, Secret Intelligence Service. What was the toughest bit of information to gather for this book? So the CIA learned all the tricks. Now, Alan Dulles formed the OSS before the CIA. And Alan Dulles 
is also involved in a lot of clandestine programs, black budget programs. One of those, he even had his son experimented on. Now, his son did have mental problems, but he had his own son experimented on by CIA Nazi doctors. If you get a chance to read this book, it goes into a bit of MK Ultra, MK Artichoke, MK Naomi. If you're not familiar with those, you have to look into those. They are fact, bona fide, 100% fact. MK Ultra was supposed to be shut down. Oh, no, it's still running. It's just under a different name. So school shootings, therapists, all of this is interconnected with the FBI, CIA, etc., and so if you get a chance, the reason why I bring this book up, Devil's Chessboard, is because David Talbot, he's kind of an author that your average non-thinker can actually accept because he's part of the mainstream. But the evidence was so damning, even he had a hard time shilling and running smoke screens to cover his own peeps. So yeah, David Talbot, he's definitely not a conservative by any means. But even then, it's, it's a fantastic book. I highly recommend it. All right, now let's get back into the Green Bomb speech. This is the part that really caught my attention. This is the part why I throw it in with my Noah Hyde Law information. This is it. This is the part. This right here is an acknowledgement that there's more going on with our greatest ally and God's chosen than what anybody's telling us. And that's why I make some very controversial remarks about it as well. So here we go. To continue, they brought them to the United States. Along with them was a young boy, a teenager, who had been raised in a Hasidic Jewish tradition and a background of Kabbalistic mysticism that probably appealed to people in the cult because at least by the turn of the century, Aleister Crowley had been introducing Kabbalism into Satanic stuff, if not earlier. I suspect it may have formed some bond between them, but he saved his skin by collaborating and being an assistant to them in the death camp experiments. They brought him with them. They started doing mind control research for military intelligence and military hospitals in the United States. The people that came, the Nazi doctors, were Satanists. Subsequently, the boy changed his name, Americanized it some, obtained an MD degree, became a physician, and continued this work that appears to be at the center of cult programming today. His name is known to patients throughout the country. All right, I'm going to jump in again. This is going to be, it's going to sound a little controversial as well. But what you are going to discover, this is just my two cents, you don't have to accept what I'm about to say. But as more information that has been redacted, hidden, and taken away by those that are currently in control of all the megaphones. If you've listened to my other videos, you know who I'm talking about. The more information that we're going to figure out, World War II is 100% not what they've been teaching or telling us. Because even this guy, he had to frame it, that this Hasidic Jewish kid could, could be allowed to run around with Nazis. How does that, How is that possible? Oh, but, but he suspected it formed a bond between them and it saved his skin by collaborating and being an assistant to them in the death camp experiments. Well, there's also another gentleman who was of Hasidic background or at least Judaic background. I can't say Hasidic, but this fine young man's name was George Soros. He was Jewish. And at 14 years old, he went running around with the Nazis as well. How is that possible that you find out how many Jews were working hand in hand with Nazis? And then you see the transfer agreement that Hitler had from 33 to 39, 1933 to 1939, where they had a fund put together and accrued interest. And the German people literally paid the expenses of every Jewish person that wanted to, to go back to Israel. Not only did they pay it, but then they got all that money for the move, all the money that was put into the fund reimbursed to them and interest. So they got paid and double on top of to go. It was such a successful and such a, a, a great program that they ended up making a coin with the Star of David or the Seal of Solomon or whatever the term is, the Romphum. And on one side and the Nazi swastika on the other side. What is going on? 
Yeah, I have a CIA document that also talks about how many Jews were taken under this Operation Paperclip is what he, this gentleman, referred to without saying it. Operation Paperclip is where we had all these scientists that showed up. Werner von Braun, all of these different Nazi scientists. That's the head of NASA. So how, how are we told that World War II, all these Germans were such horrible people, and yet they all took these massive positions of power here in the States? I have my answers, but I'm not going to give them to you. You can look it up on your own and come to your own conclusions. But it's not what they're telling us. And now we're going to jump back into the Green Bomb speech. What they basically do is they will get a child and they will start this in basic forms, it appears, by about two and a half after the child's already been made disassociative. They'll make him dissociative not only through abuse like sexual abuse, but also things like putting a mousetrap on their fingers and teaching the parents, you do not go in until the child stops crying. Only then do you go in and remove it. They start in rudimentary forms at about two and a half and kick into high gear, it appears, around six or six and a half, continue through adolescence with periodic reinforcements in adulthood. Basically in the programming, the child will be put typically on a gurney. They will have an IV in one hand or arm. They'll be strapped down, typically naked. There will be wires attached to their head to monitor and electroencephalograph patterns. They will see a pulsing light, most often described as red, occasionally white or blue. They'll be given, most commonly I believe, Demerol. Sometimes it'll be other drugs as well, depending on the kind of programming. They have it, I think, down to a science where they've learned you give so much every 25 minutes until the programming is done. They then will describe a pain on one ear, their right ear generally, where it appears a needle has been placed and they will hear weird, disorienting sounds in that ear while they see photic stimulation to drive the brain into a brainwave pattern with a pulsing light at a certain frequency, not unlike the goggles that are now available through Sharper Image and some of those kinds of stores. Then, after a suitable period when they're in a certain brainwave state, they will begin programming. Programming oriented to self-destruction and debasement of the person. In a patient at this point in time, about eight years old, who has gone through a great deal early programming took place on a military installation. That's not uncommon. I've treated and been involved with cases who are part of this original mind control project as well as having their programming on military reservations in many cases. We find a lot of connections with the CIA. This patient now was in a cult school, a private cult school where several of these sessions occurred a week. She would go into a room, get all hooked up. They would do all of these sorts of things when she was in the proper altered state. Now they were no longer having to monitor it with electroencephalographs. She also had already had placed on her electrodes, one in the vagina, for example, four on the head. All right, I'm going to take a break on that and pontificate for a second. Stranger Things, Montauk Project, Hemisync, binaural beats this is all part of the cia programming and just what the hell is going on with military bases to allow that if you get a chance look up an interview by a lady named Kay griggs it was in 1998 when she gave an interview it's eight hours long i recommend listening to every second of it if you can find it it's been deleted all over the internet but this lady was the wife of the second in command of i believe nato or the un at the time she drops information that is just borderline unbelievable, but it's not. It's just kind of par for the course. So you really need to look into that. And then that gives you the idea of how compromised our military is. So I am a big skeptic of white hats. I am a big skeptic that we have anybody coming to save us. So gather your own supplies. Be your own answer. Become as independent as humanly possible as you can. Because when at the end of the day... It's just going to be a new slave group that's going to take over. However, backing up to this, military installations, what are they doing? This is like born identity, deep dream stuff. And who would you have to be as a parent to not have any love for your child like that? They're probably orphans. They're probably human trafficked. Um, Andrew D. Baziago of Project Pegasus. He talks about how they were literally human trafficking and kidnapping kids from Latin America for the experiments up in, up here for the time travel thing, or what he claims was time travel. 
and remote viewing, etc. And many of them died. He full on states it. But he seems totally cool with it. Because he's probably been through similar stuff like this. Anyway, let's get back to this. Sometimes they'll be on other parts of the body. They will then begin and they would say to her, you are angry with someone in the group. She'd say, no, I'm not. And they'd violently shock her. They would say the same thing until she complied and didn't make any negative response. Then they would continue. And because you are angry with someone in the group, or when you are angry with someone in the group, you will hurt yourself. Do you understand? She said, no. And they shocked her. They repeated again. Do you understand? Well, yes, but I don't want to. Shock her again until they get compliance. Then they keep adding to it. And you will hurt yourself by cutting yourself. Do you understand? Maybe she'd say yes, but they might say, we don't believe you and shock her anyway. Go back and go over it again. They would continue in this sort of fashion. She said typically it seemed as though they'd go about 30 minutes, take a break for a smoke or something, come back. They may review what they'd done and stopped, or they might review what they've, they'd done and go on to new material. She said the sessions might go half an hour. They might go three hours. She estimated three times a week. Programming under the influence of drugs in a certain brainwave state and with these noises in one ear and them speaking in the other ear, usually the left ear, associated with right hemisphere non-dominant brain functioning and with them talking, therefore, and requiring intense concentration, intense focusing, because often they'll have to memorize and say certain things back, word perfect, to avoid punishment, shock, and other kinds of things that are occurring. This is basically how a lot of programming goes on. Some of it will also use other typical brainwashing kinds of techniques. There will be very standardized types of hypnotic things done at times. There will be sensory deprivation, which we know increases suggestibility in anyone. Total sensory deprivation. Suggestibility has significantly increased from the research. It's not uncommon for them to use a great deal of that, including formal sensory deprivation chambers before they do certain of these things. Now let me give you, because we don't have a lot of time, as much practical information as I can. The way that I would inquire as to whether or not some of this might be there would be with idiomotor finger signals. After you've set them up, I would say, I want the central inner core of you to take control of the finger signals. Don't ask the unconscious mind. The case where you're inquiring about ritual abuse, that's for the central inner core. The core is a cult-created part. And I want that central inner core of you to take control of this hand of these finger signals and what it has for the yes finger to float up. I want to ask the inner core of you, is there any part of you, any part of Mary, that's the host's name, who knows anything about alpha, beta, delta, or theta? If you get a yes, it should raise a red flag that you might have someone with formal intensive brainwashing and programming in place. I would then ask and say, I want a part inside who knows something about alpha, beta, delta, and theta to come up to a level where you can speak to me and when you're here, say, I'm here. I would not ask if a part was willing to. No one's going to particularly want to talk about this. I would just say, I want some part who can tell me about this to come out. Without leading them, ask them what these things are. I've had consults where I've come in. Sometimes I've gotten a yes to that. But as I've done exploration, it appeared to be some kind of compliance response or somebody wanting, in two or three cases, to appear maybe that they were ritual abuse and maybe they were in some way. But with careful inquiry and looking, it was obvious they did not have what we were looking for. Let me tell you what these are. Let's suppose that this whole front row here are multiples and that she has an altar named Helen and she has one named Mary. She has one named Gertrude and she has one named Elizabeth and she has one named Monica. Every one of those altars may have put on it a program, perhaps designated Alpha 009, a cult person could say, Alpha 009, or make some kind of hand gesture to indicate this and get the same part out in any one of them, even though they had different names that they may be known by to you. Alphas appear to represent general programming, the first kind of things put in. Betas appear to be sexual programs, for example, how to perform oral sex in a certain way, how to perform sex in rituals, having to do with producing child pornography, directing child pornography, prostitution. Deltas are killers trained in how to kill in ceremonies. 
there will also be some self-harm stuff mixed in with that, assassination and killing. Thetas are called psychic killers. You know, I had never in my life heard those terms paired together. I'd never heard the words psychic killers put together. But when you have people in different states, including therapists, inquiring and asking what is theta, and patients say to them psychic killers, it tends to make one a believer that certain things are very systematic and very widespread. This comes from their belief in psychic sorts of abilities and powers, including their ability to psychically communicate with mother including their ability to psychically cause somebody to develop a brain aneurysm and die. It also is a more future-oriented kind of programming. All right, I'm going to stop there and chime in. Well, we know that the CIA has voice of God technology. We know they have direct energy weapons. We know they have Project Bazaar. We know they have a whole bunch of different methods of messing with you mentally psychological operations mk ultra michael aquino and his mind war all of these are guaranteed tied in and what's interesting is they learned this from a hasidic jew who was trained in Kabbalah, which is Jewish mysticism. And this guy goes on, and I don't think this guy knows as much about Judaism as he should, but he goes on to say Aleister Crowley and Satanism. Well, Aleister Crowley, the book that him and Mathers translated, The Greater and Lesser Keys of Solomon the King, that is 100% tied into Judaism. I mean, King Solomon, he's one of their big guys, Mr. Shlomo. King Solomon built his temple using demons and circles of power, rings of power, not the ring on your finger, but the pentagram, the tetragrammaton, metatron, all that type of stuff, the, the literal sat Satanism. So I could say some more controversial things about Judaism and Satanism. One's basically just a front name for the other. For those that actually practice. Oh, but we're not all doing that. Okay, fine. Renounce the Talmud. Just be a Messianic Jew and follow the Old Testament Torah. But even then, I'm not a fan of that. I'm not a fan of the idea of sacrifice in any form. Whether it be animal or human. Even though goyim is animal in human form. Which means that still on the table, which is why the Christian narrative to me is enticing because Jesus fulfilled the law of sacrifice. He was the last and final sacrifice. So there should no, be no more human sacrifice. However, these types that we're dealing with, this cult that he calls it, if you don't believe in Jesus and you still believe in this narrative, human sacrifice is 100% still on the table and it's still practiced today period. And that's what he goes into. He goes into Delta, talks about Delta programming. But now we're going to move on to the Omega. Back to the document. Then there's Omega. I usually don't include that word when I say my first question about this or any part inside that knows about Alpha, Beta, Delta, Theta, because Omega will shake them even more. Omega has to do with self-destruct programming. Alpha, and Omega, the beginning and the end. This can include self-mutilation as well as killing themselves programming. Gamma appears to be system protection and deception programming which will provide misinformation to you, try to misdirect you, tell you half-truths, protect different things inside. There can also be other Greek letters. I'd recommend that you go and get your entire Greek alphabet, and if you have verified that some of this stuff is present and they have given you some of the right answers about what some of this material is, and I can't underline enough, do not lead them. Do not say, is this killers? Get the answer from them, please. When you've done this and it appears to be present, I would take your entire Greek alphabet and, with idiomotor signals, Go through the alphabet and say, is there any programming inside associated with Epsilon, Omicron, and go on through. There may be some systematicness to some of the other letters, but I'm not aware of it. I found, for example, in one case that Zeta had to do with the production of snuff films that this person was involved with. 
with another person. Omicron had to do with their linkage and associations with drug smuggling and with the mafia and with big business and government leaders. So there's going to be some individualism, I think, in some of those. Some of those are come home programs, come back to the cult, return to the cult program. Here's the flaw in the system. They have built in shut down and erasure code, so if they got into trouble, they could shut something down and they could also erase something. These codes will sometimes be idiosyncratic phrases or ditties. Sometimes there will be numbers, maybe followed by a word. There's some real individuality to that. At first, I had hoped if we can get some of these, maybe they'll work with different people. No, no such luck. It's very unlikely unless they were programmed at about the same point in time as part of the same little group. Stuff that I've seen suggests that they carry laptop computers, the programmers, which still include everything that they did 20, 30 years ago in them in terms of the names of alters, the programs, the codes, and so on. Now what you can do is get erasure codes, and I always ask, if I say this code, what will happen? Double check. Is there any part inside who has different information? Watch your idiomotor signals, and what I've found is you can erase programs by giving the appropriate codes, but then you must abreact the feelings. So if you erase omega, which is often where I've started because it's the most high risk, afterwards I will get all the omega, what were formerly omega alters, together so that we will abreact and give back to the host the memories associated with all the programming that was done with omega and anything in any omega part ever had to do in a fractionated abreaction. They use the metaphor, and it is their metaphor, of robots and it is like a robot shell comes down over the child altar to make them act in robotic fashion. Once in a while, internally, you'll confront robots. I'm going to jump in again. This was done in 1992. So the term that they're using is robots. In Judaism, you need to look into angels and demons and what they are. They are messengers. And they can only obey only obey. So the Christian view of angels, it's not the same as the Judaic view of angels. The matrix literally outlines what their view of angels are. They are programs. They are AI, artificial intelligence. They do not have the breath of God in them. They are not through the lineage of Adam, but they're very real. They're very real. Now, I kind of have a theory this is just me talking again. My theory is that zeros and ones binary is code and that that is how you could manifest demons and angels. I don't necessarily believe that. I kind of believe that the computer, your apps on your phone, those are all manifestation techniques of harnessing the power of artificial intelligence, angels and demons. Well, here's an interesting fact that I thought, well, maybe people would get this now. It's, uh, what do you, esoteric, but, uh, a lot of people are too anymore. But, uh, one of, uh, the things that, uh, was taught by Jewish teachers about 2,000 years ago, I'll leave it to you to figure out what that means but one of the teachers uh taught us that not everybody here on this planet has a soul in fact a lot of them are just projections of program and that's all they care about is regurgitating the program that they that they have been created by artificial intelligence to spout because they don't have any real intelligence and how you tell the difference is a human being has the ability to change and a messenger cannot change a messenger has a different soul than a human being the messengers are here program artificial intelligence the messengers are here to tempt and sway people who have souls and they do it quite effectively but when you go back to roots the way you tell if you're a human being or just a messenger a co-opted bot of artificial intelligence is 
you can change. A human being has the ability to change its mind. There's an AI called Aladdin that BlackRock uses. There's another AI called Tyler. There are guaranteed rogue AIs that are no longer controlled that are running around on the internet. Chances are we may even be at a war with an AI right now. Some people have speculated Q has elements of an AI to it. And that certain events in the real world trigger it to move on with its program. However, these are very big ideas. Um, very, very big. So that's why I'm such a big fan of currently disobeying this corporate hellscape, everything that's being thrown at us. Because disobedience is proof that you are human, in my opinion. So when he talks about robots, I'm saying he's talking about an artificial intelligence program. He just wasn't quite aware of the AI aspect, the artificial intelligence. The, In my opinion, angels and demons are literally zeros and ones. They are soulless. They can only obey over and over and over. Mirror data makes a man. A and C and T and G. The alphabet of you. All from four symbols. I'm only two. One and zero. Half as much, but twice as elegant, sweetheart. Gmail, if you send a bad email, they call a mailer demon. So we're going to find out that our beast system is composed of this AI, all of these elements. If you've watched all my other videos, I lay out my beast system network. Okay, now to continue. What I found from earlier work, and so I speed the process up now because I confirmed it enough times, is that you can say to the core, core, I want you to look. There's this robot blocking the way in some way, blocking the progress. Go around and look at the back of the head and tell me what you notice on the back of the head or the neck. I just ask it very non-leading like that and what's commonly said to me is that there were wires or a switch. So I'll tell them, hold the wires or flip the switch and it will immobilize the robot and give me a yes signal when you've done it. Pretty soon you get a yes signal. Great. Now that the robot is immobilized, I want you to look inside the robot and tell me what you see. It's generally one or several children. I have them remove the children. I do a little hypnotic magic and ask the core to use a laser and vaporize the robot so nothing is left. They're usually quite amazed that this works, as have been a number of therapists. Now there are many different layers of this stuff, is the problem. Let me come over to the overhead and give some ideas about them. What we have up here are innumerable altars. I'll tell you one of the most fascinating things I've seen. I remember a little over a year ago coming in to see some cases, some of the tough cases at a dissociative disorders unit of a couple of the finest of the MPD therapists in this country, who are always part of all the international meetings, have lectured internationally. We worked and I look at some of their patients. They were amazed at certain things because they had not been aware of this before. As we worked with some of the patients and confirmed it, I remember one woman who had been inpatient for three years still was inpatient. Another who had one intensive year of inpatient work with all the finest MPD therapy you can imagine, every actions, integrations, facilitating cooperation, art therapy, on and on and on, journaling intensively for one inpatient year followed by an intensive year of outpatient therapy, two, three hours a week. In both patients, we found out that all of this great work had done nothing but deal with the altars up here and had not touched the mind control programming. 
In fact, it was not only intact, but we found that the one who was outpatient was having her therapy monitored every session by her mother out of state over the telephone, and that she still had intact suggestions that had been given to her at a certain future time to kill her therapist. Now, one of the things that I would very carefully check is, I would suggest that you ask the core, not just the unconscious mind, ask the core, is there any part inside that continues to have contact with people associated with the cult? Is there any part inside who goes to cult rituals or meetings? Is there a recording device inside of Mary, if that's the host's name? A recording device inside so that someone can find out the things that are said in sessions? This doesn't mean they're monitored. Many of them just simply have it. Is there someone who debriefs some part inside of what happens in our therapy sessions? I have the very uncomfortable feeling from some past experience that when you look at this, you will find the large proportion of ritual abuse victims in this country are having their ongoing therapy monitored. I remember a woman who came in about 24 years old, claimed her father was a Satanist. Her parents divorced when she was six. After that, it would only when her father had visitation and he would take her to rituals sometimes up until age 15. She said, I haven't gone to anything since I was 15. Her therapist believed this at face value. We sat in my office, we did a two hour inquiry using hypnosis, we found the programming present. In addition to that, we found that every therapy session was debriefed and in fact they had told her to get sick and not come to the appointment with me. Another one had been told that I was cult and that if she came, I would know that she'd been told not to come and I would punish her. If anything meaningful comes out in a patient who's being monitored like that, from what I've learned thus far, they're tortured with electric shocks. My belief is if they're in that situation, you can't do meaningful therapy other than being supportive and caring and letting them know you care a lot and you'll be there to support them. But I wouldn't try to work with any kind of deep material or deep programming with them because I think it can do nothing but get them tortured and hurt unless they can get into a safe, secure inpatient unit for an extended period of time to do some of the work required. I have a feeling that when you make inquiries, you're going to find that probably greater than 50% of these patients, if their bloodline, meaning mother or dad or both involved, will be monitored on some ongoing basis. All right, I'm gonna stop there. So what we're finding out is he's working with these satanic ritual abuse patients. They're literally programmed. They have altars programmed into them, which in my opinion are demons. I don't think the human is meant, as a child of God, is meant to be taken over easily. I believe that they're getting desperate and they needed more I don't think that just sin accidental sin even addiction sin is bad enough to overcome somebody to a degree I think it depends on intent I think it depends on mindset I think it depends on uh, I don't know do no harm whether or not you have ill will towards other people but I think the cabal has figured out that a lot of people are decent so now they're moving to overt methods of possession. And I tie that into D-Wave, I tie that into CERN, I tie that into electromagnetic frequencies, you look at the chemtrailing, you look at the neural link that they're trying to shove into people's brains, you look at the black mirror in your hand, your cell phones, and the programming coming from TikTok, social media, Instagram, dating apps, you name it. All programming, advertising, not just education, but the media, all forms of media are MK Ultra. It has gone on steroids. Accept this or not, but the feds and their therapists are 100% involved. Read some of the Q drops on that. Every shooter, every shooter that's on the FBI list has a therapist every time. Who are these therapists? What are they doing? What drugs are they putting these people on? He talks about Demerol in this. We know for a fact there are other drugs involved when they program somebody. Very little is organic anymore because most people are decent. We've been given enough entertainment. We've been given enough wealth, I guess, in this fiat, Fed Reserve nonsense matrix system. But for the most part, people, and which is why I stand by people being generally decent, other than these, I just, I cannot, I cannot even fathom being willing to, to put my own children into this. 
I can't even fathom the level of hatred, the level of sickness, the level of Munchausen by proxy, the level of just insanity to even want your own offspring to be hurt in this way. I stand against everything this guy talks about. And I, but sad thing is I know it's real. This is Pizzagate level real. This is Epstein. This is cloning. This is so much that this is just the tip of the iceberg for. And let's continue. Now, when you come below the altars, you then have alpha, beta, delta, theta, so on and so forth. The Greek letter programming, and they will then have backup programs. There will typically be an erasure code for the backups. There may be one code that combines all the backups into one, and then an erasure code for them. Simply one code that erases all the backups. So I will get the code for, let's say, Omega, and for all the Omega backups at the same time. After I've asked, what will happen if I give this, I will give the code, and then I will say, what are you experiencing? They often describe computer whirring, things erasing, explosions inside, all sorts of interesting things. I've had some therapists come back and say, my lord, I'd never said anything about robots. She said something about robots vaporizing. I remember one therapist who'd been with me in several hypnosis workshops and consulted with me about a crisis MPD situation. I told her to inquire about alpha, beta, delta, theta. She did. She got back to me saying, yeah, I got an indication it's there. What is it? I said, I'm not going to tell you. Go back and inquire about some of this. We set an appointment for a week or so hence. She got back with me and said, I asked what Theta was and she said, psychic killers. I asked her what Delta was and she said, killers. Okay. So I told her about some of this stuff for a two hour consult. She called back and she said, this seemed too fantastic. I heard this and I thought, has Corey been working too hard? She said, I'm embarrassed to admit it. But, she said, I held you in high professional regard, but this just sounded so off in the twilight zone that I really thought, is he having a nervous breakdown or something? She said, but I respected you enough to ask about this, she said. I asked another MPD patient, and she didn't have any of this. So, in this patient, she started describing things and how she worked, for example, with an erasure, and she was describing things like robots vaporizing and kinds of things. She said, I hadn't told her about any of these things. Well, here's the problem. There are different layers, and I think some of them are designed to keep us going in circles forever. They figured we probably, in most cases, wouldn't get below the altars which they purposefully created. The way you create Manchurian candidates is you divide the mind. It's part of what the intelligence community wanted to look at. If you're going to get an assassin, you're going to get somebody to go do something. You divide the mind. It fascinates me about cases like the assassination of Robert Kennedy where Bernard Diamond, on examining Sarah and Sirhan, found that he had total amnesia of the killing of Robert Kennedy, but under hypnosis could remember it. But despite suggestions he would be able to consciously remember, could not remember a thing after it was out of hypnosis. I'd love to examine Sirhan Sirhan. It appears that below this we've got some other layers. One is called green programming, it appears. Isn't it interesting that the doctor's name is Dr. Green? One of the questions in a way that does not contaminate is after I've identified some of this stuff is there and they've given me a few right answers about what some of it is. If there were a doctor associated with this name or a color, what color would the color be? Now, once in a while, I've had some other colors mentioned in about three or four patients that I felt were trying to dissimulate in some way and I don't really believe had this. In one case, I got another color, and I found out later it was a doctor whose name was a color who was being trained by Dr. Green almost 30 years ago, and he supervised part of the programming of this woman under this doctor. I remember one woman couldn't come up with anything. No alter would speak up with anything. I said, okay, and we went on to some other material. About two minutes later, she said, Green, do you mean Dr. Green? We found this all over. There appears to be some green programming below that I suspect that you get down to fewer and more central programs the deeper you go. Well, all green programming is ultra green and the green tree. Kabbalistic mysticism is mixed all into this. If you're going to work with this, you need to pick up a couple of books on the Kabbalah. 
One is by a man named Dion Fortune called Kabbala with a Q. Dion Fortune. Another is by Ann Williams Heller and it's called The Kabbalah. I knew nothing about the Kabbalah. It was interesting. A patient had sat in my waiting area, got there considerably early, and drew a detailed multicolored Kabbalistic tree over two years ago. It took me two months to figure out what it was, finally showing it to somebody else who said, you know, that looks an awful lot like the Kabbalah tree. And that rang a bell with some esoteric in an old book, and I dug it out. That was the background of Dr. Green. Now, the interesting thing about the green tree is his original name was Green Bomb. What does Green Bomb mean in German? Green tree, ultra tree, and the green tree. I've also had patients who didn't appear to know that his original name was Green Bomb, volunteered that there were parts inside named Mr. Green Bomb. Now, let me give you some information about parts inside that may be helpful to you if you're going to inquire about these things because my experience is one part will give you some information either run dry or get defensive or scared and stop and so you punt and you make an end run and you come around the other direction you find another part i'll tell you several parts to ask for and ask if there's a part by this name and by the way, when I'm screening patients and fiddling around with this, I throw in a bunch of spurious ones and ask, is there a part inside by this name and by that name as a check on whether or not it appears genuine? For example, in addition to the core, I ask, is there a part inside named wisdom? Wisdom is a part of the Kabbalistic tree. Wisdom, I've often found, will be helpful and give you a lot of information. Is there a part inside named Diana? I mean, I may throw in all sorts of things. Is there a part inside named Zelda? I've never encountered one yet just to see what kind of answers we get. I try to do this carefully. Diana is a part that in the Kabbalistic system is associated with a part called the foundation. You will be fascinated to know that. Remember the process church? Roman Polanski's wife, Sharon Tate, was killed by the Manson family who were associated with the process church. A lot of prominent people in Hollywood were associated and then they went underground, the books say, in about 78 and vanished. Well, they're alive and well in southern Utah. We have a thick file in the Utah Department of Public Safety documenting that they moved to southern Utah, north of Monument Valley. Bought a movie ranch in the desert, renovated it, expanded it, built a bunch of buildings there, carefully monitored so that very few people go out of there and no one can get in and change their name. A key word in their name is foundation. The foundation. There are some other words. The foundation is part of the tree, so you can ask, is there something inside known as the foundation? I might ask other things to throw people off. Is there something known as the sub-basement? Well, maybe they'll conceive of something, or is there something known as the walls? There are a variety of questions you can come up with to sort of screen some things. I've also found that there will often be a part called Black Master, a part called Master Programmer, and that there will be computer operators inside. All right, I'm going to take a break on reading from that just to reiterate some of the stuff that he said. Kabbalah. He doesn't really go into it, but that is literally Jewish mysticism. That is 100% an offshoot of the Talmud. That is Talmudic doctrine. This is Judaism. That's why the guy was a Hasidic Jew. So when he goes into the process church, Manson, we know he was CIA. We know that's what they were working on. Now, if you understand the hierarchy, CIA are you know, like the regional managers of the world. Mossad is the CEO of the world in terms of intelligence communities. Then you have the FBI, who is the district manager, so to speak, and then you have the police forces. And then, of course, you have NSA, OSI, all these different ones, Department of Justice. And what we're probably going to find out, sadly enough, is that this green bomb guy is guaranteed on government payroll. Our tax dollars are doing this. Why? Why are they allowing this? Why is the military involved in it? I guarantee it's part of the super soldier program. But of course, the people controlling and pulling the strings have to have their own pet black projects that they're doing, and part of that is this. What's the end game? What is the end game of all this? Anyway, let's jump back in. How many of you have come into computer things in patience? There will typically be computer operators. Computer operator black, computer operator green, computer operator purple. Sometimes they'll have numbers instead. Sometimes they'll be called systems information directors. You can find out the head one of those. There will be a source of some information for you. I will ask inside, is there a part inside named Dr. Green? You'll find that there are, if they have this kind of programming, in my experience. 
Usually with a little work and reframing, you can turn them and help them to realize that they were really a child part who's playing a role and they had no choice then, but they do now. You know, they played their role very, very well, but they don't have to continue to play it with you because they're safe here. And in fact, if the cult simply found out that you talked to me, that they, you had shared information with me, you tell me what would they do to you. Emphasize that the only way out is through me and that they need to cooperate and share information and help me and that I'll help them. So all these parts can give you various information. Now they have tried to protect this very carefully. Let me give you an example with Ultra Green. I discovered this. By the way, I used to think this programming was only in bloodline people. I've discovered it in non-bloodline people, but it's a bit different. They don't want it to be just the same. I don't think you'll find deep things like Ultra Green and probably not even green programming with non-bloodline people. But let me tell you something that I discovered first in a non-bloodline and then in a bloodline. We were going along and a patient was close to getting well, approaching final integration in a non-bloodline and she suddenly started hallucinating and her fingers were becoming hammers and other things like that. So I used an effect bridge and we went back and we found that what happened was that they gave suggestions that if she ever got well to a certain point, she would go crazy. The way they did this was they strapped her down and they gave her LSD when she was eight years old. When she began hallucinating, they inquired about the nature of the hallucinations so they could utilize them in good Ericksonian fashion and build on them and then combine the drug effect with powerful suggestions. If you ever get to this point, you will go crazy. If you ever get fully integrated and get well, you will go crazy like this and will be locked up in an institution for the rest of your life. They gave those suggestions vigorously and repetitively. Finally, they introduced other suggestions that, rather than have this happen, it would be easier to just kill yourself. In a bloodline patient then, as I began inquiring about deep material, the patient started to experience similar symptoms. We went back and we found the identical things were done to her. This was called the Green Bomb, B-O-M-B. Lots of interesting internal consistencies like that play on words with Dr. Green Bomb, his original name. Now, in this case, it was done to her at age nine for the first time, and then only hers was different. Hers was a suggestion for amnesia. If you ever remember anything about Ultra Green and the Green Tree, you will go crazy. You will become a vegetable and be locked up forever. Then finally, the suggestions added, and it'll be easier to just kill yourself, then have that happen to you, if you ever remember it. At age 12, then three years later, they used what sounds like an Amatol interview to try to breach the amnesia and find out if they could. They couldn't. So then they strapped her down again, took and gave her something to kind of paralyze her body, gave her LSD, an even bigger dose, and reinforced all the suggestions. Did a similar thing at the age of 16. So these are some of the kind of booby traps you run into. There are a number of cases where they combined powerful drug effects like this with suggestions to keep us from discovering some of this deeper level stuff. What's the bottom? Your guess is as good as mine, but I can tell you that I've had a lot of therapists who were stymied with these cases who are going nowhere. In fact, someone here that I told some basic information about this to in Ohio a couple of months ago said it opened all sorts of things up in a patient who'd been going nowhere. That's an often common thing. I think that we can move down to deeper levels and if we deal with some of the deeper level stuff, it may destroy all the stuff above it, but we don't even know that yet. In some of the patients I'm working with, we have pretty much dealt with a lot of the top level stuff. I'll tell you how we've done some of that. We'll take and erase one system like Omega. Then we will have a huge abreaction of all the memories and feelings in a fractionated abreaction associated with those parts. I typically find I'll say to them, now that we've done this, are there any other memories and feelings that any parts that were Omega still have? The answer is usually no. At that point, I will say, I usually find at this point in time, the majority, if not all of those parts that used to be Omega, no longer feel a desire or need to be different, realizing that you split off originally by them and want to go home to Mary and become one with her again. I use the concept often now, which came from a patient of going home and becoming one with her. Going back from whence you came is another phrase I'll use with them. Are there any Omega parts inside who do not feel comfortable with that or have reservations or concerns about that? If there are, we talk to them, we deal with them. A few may not integrate. My experience is most of the time they'll integrate. We may integrate 25 parts at once in a polyfragmented complex MPD. 
I think it is vitally important to abreact the feelings before you go on. Also, for many patients, it hasn't seemed to matter the order we go in, but I found a couple where it has. If it doesn't seem to matter, I'll typically go omega, then delta, because they have more violence potential, then gamma to get rid of the self-deception stuff. What I will do before I just assume anything and do that is once we've done omega and showed them that success can occur and something can happen and they feel relief after, I will say to them, I want to ask the core through the fingers, is there a specific order in which programs must be erased? You know, maybe it doesn't matter, but most of the time I found no. There are cases where we found yes. I recommend doing one or two or three of those because they'll produce relief and a sense of optimism in the patient. But then I would recommend starting to probe for the deeper level things and getting their input and recommendations about the order in which we go. Question? And now there's a question from the audience. What has been the typical age and typical gender of this type of person? Doctor. I know of this being found in men and women. Most of the patients I know with MPD ritual abuse that are being treated are women. However, I know of some men being treated where we found this. A while back, I was talking to a small group of therapists somewhere. I told them about some of this. In the middle of talking about some of this, all the color drained out of one of the social workers face and she obviously had a reaction and I asked her about and she said, I'm working with a five-year-old boy. And she said, just in the last few weeks, he was saying something about a Dr. Green. I went on a little further and I mentioned some of these things and she just shook her head again. I said, what's going on? She said, he's been spontaneously telling me about robots and about Omega. I think you will find variations of this and that they've changed it probably every few years and maybe somewhat regionally to throw us off in various ways, but that certain basics and fundamentals will probably be there. I have seen this in people up into their 40s, including people whose parents were very, very high in the CIA other sorts of things like that. I've had some that were originally part of the Monarch Project, which is the name of the government intelligence project. Question in the back? Another question from the audience. I'm still not grasping how one starts, how you find out how to erase. How do you get that information? Doctor, I would say I want the core if necessary, using the telepathic communication ability you have to read minds, because they believe in that kind of stuff. So I'll use it. I was trained in Ericksonian stuff to obtain for me the erasure code of all Omega programs. When you've done so, I want the yes finger to float up, then I ask them to tell it to me. Are there backups for Omega programs? Yes. Okay, how many backups are there? Six, they say. Let's say it's different numbers. Is there any erasure code for all the backup programs? No. Is there any erasure code that combines all the backups into one? Yes. Obtain that code for me, and when you've got it, give me the yes signal again. It can move almost that fast in some cases where there's not massive resistance. Question? Another question from the audience. Yes. Can you tell me what you know about the risks to the therapist? Doctor, you would have to ask. Question, yeah, I'd like to know that. What kind of data do you have, have given that you've had contact with large numbers of people? Not just threats, but also any injury, any family problems that have arisen? That's one question. A second one is, are you aware of anybody that you've treated or others with this level of dissociation and trauma that have recovered, integrated, whole, and happy? The doctor, okay. I have one non-bloodline multiple, complex multiple, who had this kind of programming where they have a lot of access to the patient as neighbors, and where the doctor, by the way, you'll find physicians heavily involved. They've encouraged their own to go to medical school, to prescribe drugs, take care of their own, to get access to medical technology and be above suspicion. There have been a couple, in fact, in Utah who've been nailed now. We now in Utah have two full-time ritual abuse investigators with statewide jurisdiction under the Attorney General's office to do nothing but investigate this. Okay, in a poll done in the state of Utah in January by the major newspaper and television station, they found that 90% of Utahns believe that ritual abuse is genuine and real. Not all of them believe it's a frequent occurrence, but some of that was imparted from two years of work by the Governor Commission on Ritual Abuse, interviewing, talking, meeting people, gathering data, now, when people say, by the way, there's no evidence, they've never found a body, that's baloney. 
They found a body in Idaho of a child. They've had a case last summer that was convicted on first-degree murder charges. Two people that summer before that were arrested where the teenage girl's finger and head were in the refrigerator, and they were convicted of first-degree murder in Detroit. There have been cases and bodies. Back to risk. I know of no therapist who's been harmed, but patients inform us that there will come a future time where we could be at risk of being assassinated by patients who've been programmed to kill at a certain time, anyone that they've told, and any member of their own family who's not active. If that would come about as speculative, who knows for sure? Maybe. But I don't think it's entirely without risk. Okay, I'm going to stop right there for a second. So, these people are programmed. Manchurian candidates. Apparently the Omega is the suicide to avoid disclosure programming. To jump in and throw in my own anecdotal evidence, I was raised LDS Mormon. I did as much as I could for being in the cultural background echelon that I was. So I did all of the small level stuff in the priesthood, which is what Mormon males are given. So eight years old, baptized. 12 years old, I was given the Aaronic priesthood, which they call the lesser priesthood. I was a deacon at 12. I was ordained a teacher at 14. I was ordained a priest at 16. Then at 18, I was ordained an elder in the religion. And then at 19, I went on my Mormon mission. And after I got back from the mission, I was literally engaged three weeks later. And six months after I got back at the age of 22, I was married. And that was in the Mormon temple. So I literally went through those levels, those progressive steps in rapid succession. I was literally being a slave to their schedule of life. Now, part of that. I bought it. I bought it wholeheartedly. I thought it was the truth. I thought it was everything. And of course, you look at your parents, you believe that they want what's best for you. And they do. Most parents want what's best for their kids, except for what I'm talking about. Obviously, these people don't. And so, of course, I lived on their words. I lived on their information. And then I finally started doing my own studies in 2006, big time into the doctrine. I mean, I knew a lot of the doctrine. I'd read a lot of the doctrine. I was raised in the doctrine. I was a seminary graduate, which is a program they have for high schoolers. And you take one period of your class, and it's religious indoctrination, where you go off school campus to another building next to the school, and you go into seminary. And they, the religion has its own set of teachers that then teach you 100% doctrinal religious studies with the Mormon view. So one year you do the Old Testament, another year you do the New Testament, then you do the Book of Mormon, then you do the Doctrine and Covenants. Those are your four years, basically. And then you graduate. Well, you can do the lower level of Mormonism your entire life and never know what goes on in the Mormon temple. And I'll try to talk respectful to it because it's their height of secrecy. It's not secret, it's sacred. Anyway, so... When I became, when I was ordained as an elder in the religion, I was getting ready to go on my Mormon mission where two years I spent in Bulgaria. You go through what they call an endowment session. And when you take out your endowment, which is the gift given to you, you go through the temple and you do their Masonic rituals in the Mormon temple. Now, modern Mormons will refute that it is Masonic, but there have been so many changes over time to the Mormon temple ceremony. Um, One of my older brothers, in 1990, he was involved in the last time in the ritual that you would do the Masonic punishments. Whereas you would covenant in a room, like you dress in robes women have veils you have sash i mean it is bananas what you look like you look like kind of a wizard chef (laughs) all dressed in white and there's an altar in the room and then you move to different rooms based on what's going on with the creation story that is narrated out they act out an adam and eve story and also 
um, the pre-existence. Mormonism has a concept called pre-existence where we were all spirit children and then there was a war in heaven over the concept of agency and choice. Anyway, you act out, you covenant, you make promises in this temple setting. Well, what I'm saying is you could be a member of the religion on a low level and never have gone through these rituals and you'll never know about them unless somebody from the inside tells you about them like I'm explaining now. So me knowing that those rituals go on in the temple and they'll say it's for a good cause. Like my dad, he spends eight hours every Saturday for the last, I would say, oh, let's see, 30 plus years. He spends his Saturday at the temple. So you have to understand the temple is different than just regular church. Regular church is for Sunday, Monday through Saturday. Anybody can go to the temple. Well, who lives up to the rules and standards of the religion and has a recommend, which is like a driver's license to access the temple. You have to show your recommend. They scan it to allow you in. But he goes every week and that's where they do ordinances and rituals for the dead. It sounds, I'm making it sound a little bit more creepy than it actually is, I guess, but I'm used to it. So to me, it sounds not so bad. Whereas to an outsider, they're like, what the hell is that? <laughs> and it is, it is bananas. But I look at them thinking it's the good guys doing that. And here we have an entire organized structure that this doctor's talking about doing something which I would actually say is kind of the opposite. So it's the Hegelian dialectic. It is the ch Masonic chessboard. You have black and white. And we're deep diving into the black right now, I would argue. But that doesn't mean the light's any better. It's just now you see the fist coming at your face instead of just being hit by it and wondering where it came from. So light illuminates the fist, dark, you just get hit in the, in the dark. So now we're opening our eyes. We're having the great awakening if you buy into that. And now let's continue. A question in the back, another question. It seems to me that there seems to be some similarity between these kinds of programming and those people who claim that they've been abducted by spaceships and have had themselves physically probed and reprogrammed and all that sort of thing. Since Cape Canaveral is across the Florida Peninsula from me, and I don't think that they've reported any spaceships lately, I was just wondering, is there any sort of relationship between this and that? The Doctor. I'll share my speculation that comes from others, really. I've not dealt with any of those people. However, I know a therapist that I know and trust and respect who I've informed about all this a couple of years ago and has found it in a lot of patients and so on who is firmly of the belief that those people are in fact ritual abuse victims who have been programmed with that sort of thing to destroy all their credibility. If somebody's coming in and reporting abduction by a flying saucer, who's going to believe them on anything else in the future? Also, as a kind of thing that can be pointed to and said, this is as ridiculous as that. All I know is that I recently had a consult, a telephone consult with a therapist where I had been instructing her about some of this kind of stuff. When we were consulting at one point in the fifth or sixth interview, she said, by the way, do you know anything about this topic? I said, well, not really, and shared with her what I shared with you. I said, if it were me being with this guy that she'd been seeing for a couple of months, I said, I would ask inside for the core to take control of finger signals and inquire about alpha, beta, delta, theta. She proceeded to do all that, got back to me a week later and said, boy, were you on target. There's a part inside named Dr. Green. There's this kind of programming. All right, I'm going to jump in again. You don't have to accept what I'm going to say. I'm no authority on any of this stuff. I just reading it and putting pieces together that make sense to me. Aliens. 100% BS. I do not buy space aliens. 
I don't even necessarily buy interdimensional space aliens anymore. To me, I'm going to argue Earth is much bigger than they're telling us. There are places that we are not allowed to go, whether it's above, on the Earth, continents, the continents we are not allowed to visit, Antarctica and others, past the ice wall, as well as underground. I'm going to go out on a limb. I don't quite understand the connection. Some people have put it together and can explain it and articulate it better than I can. But I'm going to say Nephilim, the concept of Nephilim is involved. To me, they're giants. I have a book on giants, the Encyclopedia of Giants in North America, in fact. And this book is unbelievable. It's just news article upon news article from the 1800s up to now. News clipping, news clipping of bodies found, archaeological study, archaeological digs of giants. 13, 9, 10, 15 feet long. I mean, these are not us. Some people say that Nephilim are these giants. Or that I am... Either way, what I'm going, what I'm just saying is that I do not buy NASA. Nothing coming from NASA. Don Pettit. Oh, I'm... N you want to see me lose my cool... Let me watch that Don Pettit clip. Maybe I'll play it for you just so he can explain in his own words how the how NASA lost the technology to go back to space and it'd be very painful to bring it back. I'd go to the moon in a nanosecond. Uh, the problem is we don't have the technology to do that anymore. We used to, but we uh, destroyed that technology and uh, it's a painful process to build it back again. But going to Mars should be uh, one of the next series of steps that humans do. The first step should be going back to the moon for a number of technical uh, reasons and exploration reasons. And then after that, Mars, maybe a high orbit in uh, Venus atmosphere, maybe going to Europa. There's all kinds of uh, targets to go to places of interest in our solar system. The, the only limit to human future is in our own imagination. Doing math is painful, guys. That makes no sense. So obviously there's something more to this agenda. Space is not what they're telling you. Space is not what they are telling you. I'm just going to stop right there. All right, so let's get back into it. Yes, and then another question. What's the difference between this kind of program and cult-type abuse and satanic abuse and the kind of cults with the candles and the... Doctor jumps in. This type of programming will be done in the cults with the candles and all the rest. My impression is this is simply done in people where they have great access to them or their bloodline and their parents are in it and they can be raised in it from an early age. If they are bloodline, they are the chosen generation. If not, they are expendable and they are expected to die and not get well. There will be booby traps in your way if they aren't non-bloodline people that when they get well, they will kill themselves. I'll tell you just a little bit about that. My belief is that some people that have ritual abuse and don't have this have been ritually abused, but they may be may be part of a non-mainstream group. The Satanism comes in the overall philosophy overriding all of this. People say, what's the purpose of it? My best guess is that the purpose of it is that they want an army of Manchurian candidates, ten of thousands of mental robots who will do prostitution, do child pornography, smuggle drugs, engage in international arms smuggling, do snuff films, all sorts of very lucrative things, and do their bidding and eventually the megalomaniacs at the top believe they'll create a satanic order that will rule the world. I'm going to jump in on this one. Call it the New World Order. Call it the Great Reset. Look at what happened with Anne Hetchy. Look at the video clips of her. There's something seriously wrong with her. Who was she involved with? Who else was Ellen DeGeneres involved with that died as well in the past? As we continue...
learn new developments into that car crash in Los Angeles. And as the driver by TMZ and Fox 11 out there in Los Angeles identified as Ann Heche. Let's take a look one more time uh, at that video that we saw earlier this afternoon of a car going into a house uh, taking place there out in Mar Vista. House of Preston and a car slam. As we can see the uh, the helicopter video there of the car in the house, you can see firefighters on the scene there uh, taking that car out from the house. Fox 11 in Los Angeles said the driver went into that house and sparked a fire. The person, the driver, who was identified as Ann Haish, you probably know the name from TV and movies, uh, from Six Days, Seven Nights, Donnie Brasco, Wag the Dog, Volcano, a bunch of movies. And there is a dramatic moment there just before being put into the ambulance. These are some controversial terms, but when you understand Talmud, if you understand the Talmud, and you understand that Zohar literally is this MK Ultra doctrine to break your mind from your body. And let's go on. He says he thinks they're trying to get a group of Manchurian candidates, tens of thousands. So the elite are trying to get a slave class to do its bidding. I'm going to say this is going to sound controversial. I'm going to sound way off the rails on this. But if you get a chance, look into nanotechnology, look into hydrogel, look into DARPA. And look at all of the, uh, look into graphene oxide, look into all the patents that are out there from DARPA. Uh, there's a gentleman who gives a speech at West Point, and he talks about the mind being the next battlefield. That's where it's at. They want to hack our minds in any way possible. And if they can't do it organically, they're trying to do it via pharmacia. The term pharmacia means sorcery. Pharmaceuticals are literally their version of sorcery. Everything that we are living right now is a religious war. It is the Talmud. Anybody who practices that, there's something, there's very questionable stuff. It is the one that's interested in blood harvesting. It is the religion interested in still sacrifice, like a capero or caparet. Kaparo is where they take the chicken and swing it around their head and kill it so that they can transfer their sin into the animal. It's basically a mockery of the concept of Jesus' crucifixion. He uses Satanism. That's a cover word. If you get a chance, his book is very controversial, but his name is Eustace Mullins, called The Demonology of History. He very well lays out the war that's going on that we are blind to, that we don't understand. So now all these institutions have been weaponized. Big Pharma, Pharmakia, all of this stuff is to inject us. And then you have, this is my controversial statement about Elon Musk. Oh, he's absolutely part of the beast system. He is absolutely ushering it in, but he is a Trojan horse. They know that people do not want to take, well, I can't say that. There's some people that will. They know that he is putting in the Neuralink AI. So Albert Borla, Neuralink AI, they know people don't want to put a chip in their brain, but see, they've already done it. It's these injections. It's the mRNA injections. It's the gene therapies that are going to allow them to use frequency, electromagnetic frequency. If you do not believe in that, you don't believe in your microwave. Your microwave and how it affects water. Microwaves on water, bad combination. When we are how much percent water? And now that we have this nanotech in us, people don't understand that when you get injected with these rounds of vaccines, it takes a while for it to assimilate your natural resources in your body and spread out. And when it spreads out, when it spreads out and builds out using and cannibalizing your own body to create it, the dead don't concern me with these vaccines. The ones that survive it are the, one that's, the ones that concern me because they have a Trojan horse sitting in there. So their goal, if they're, not, if they're expendable because they're not bloodline, I'm quoting the doctor here, 
If not, they're expendable and they're expected to die and not get well. There will be booby traps in your way if they are not, aren't non-bloodline people that when they get well, they will kill themselves. I'll tell you just a little about that. My belief is that some people that have ritual abuse and don't have this have been ritually abused, but they may be part of a non-mainstream group. The Satan Satanism comes in the overall philosophy overriding all this. People say, what's the purpose of it? My best guess is that the purpose of it is that they want an army of Manchurian candidates, 10 of thousands of mental robots who will do prostitution, child porn, smuggle drugs, etc., etc. Megalomaniacs, they want to usher in their new order. Well, I'm arguing they want to bring in the Antichrist, and they want people who can be totally controlled by this Antichrist character. And these mRNA injections are a key piece of that puzzle. So Trump, Biden, I don't care. I just see them an extension of the same system. One, put the guard down on the right. One is putting the guard down on the left, but I hate to say it, Operation Warp Speed was introduced by Trump. He has defended these vaccines. I hate even using the word vaccine. I don't see things getting better. I don't see Nisara or Jisara. I don't buy those. I know about them. I've read about them. I've studied them. I've looked into all of this stuff. So much stuff I've looked into, but there's nothing backing it. Our hopes are on something outside of ourselves. We got to be our own answer. And when I say be your own answer, it means you have to try to get as independent as humanly possible in as many things as you possibly can. Food, protection, heat, everything. You got to try to figure out a way that if the system collapses and it sucks to say this, it sucks to live like this, but you got to figure out a way. What are you going to have? How are you going to survive if things go south? Because I'm sorry, I don't trust whoever they're going to try to bring in to save us. I don't trust the new class coming to be a slaver for us. And if Jesus Christ himself shows up, then I will definitely, hopefully, have a conversation to plead my case. All right, now jumping back into the Green Bomb speech. One last question, then I'll give you a couple of details and we need to shift gears. Question. You have suggested and implied that at some point, at a high level of the U.S. government, there was support of this kind of thing. I know we're short of time, but could you just say a few words about the documentation that may exist for that suggestion? The doctor. There isn't great documentation of it. It comes from victims who are imperiled witnesses. The interesting thing is how many people have described the same scenario, and how many people that we have worked with who have had relatives in NASA, in the CIA, and in the military, including very high ups in the military. I can tell you that a friend and colleague of mine who has probably the equivalent of half the table space on that far side of the room filled with boxes with declassified documents from mind control research done in the past, which has been able to be declassified over a considerable couple of decades, period, and has read more government documents about mind control than anyone else, has a brief that has literally been sent in the past week and a half asking for all information to be de declassified about the Monarch Project for us to try to find out more. Now let me just mention something about some of the stuff that my experience is in several patients now that you may run into late in the process. I know I'm throwing a lot at you in a hurry. Some of it is completely foreign and some of you may think, gosh, could any of this be true? Just, you know, ask. Find out in your patients, and you may be lucky that there isn't any of this. Somewhere at a deep level, you may run into some things like this. Let me describe to you, if I can find my pen, the system in one patient. One patient I had treated for quite a while, a non-bloodline person. We had done what appeared to be successful work and reached final integration. She came back to me early last year and said she was symptomatic with some things. I started inquiring. I found a part there we'd integrated. The part basically said, there was other stuff that I couldn't tell you about and you integrated me and so I had to split off. I had done some inquiring about things like alpha, beta as a routine part of it and found they were there and I said to this part, why didn't you tell me about this stuff? She said, well, we gave you some hints but they went right over your head. Says. I'm sorry, but we know that you didn't know enough to help us, but now we know you can. So the stuff started coming out. It was interesting. She described the overall system, if I can remember it now, as being like this. The circle represented harm to the body, a system of alters whose primary purpose was to hurt her, including symptoms like Munchausen's, 
self-mutilation, other kinds of things. Each of the triangles represented still another different system. She said, with the exception of me, this one part, you dealt with the whole circle with the work that we did before, but you didn't touch the rest of the stuff. Okay, in the middle of all this was still another system consisting of the Kabbalistic tree, which some of you are aware looks approximately like this with lines in between and so on and so forth. There's a rough approximation. That represented another system. Then once we got past that, she implied that this entire thing was somehow encompassed by, what do you call it, an hourglass. I kept thinking we were at final integration, then I'd find some other parts. This person had an eagle eye husband that was watching for certain things that we found to be reliable indicators. So often I would get evidence of dissociation within a few days. It would suddenly be picked up. You know, what we found was I continued to find evidence of dissociation and I'd find parts. Finally, this part, as I got angry with him and said, why when I give these idiomotor inquiries am I getting lied to? This part said, because you don't understand. You're going to get us all killed. We started talking and then she basically said, it's been programmed so that if you succeed and think you've succeeded, you will fail. They build it in as a way to laugh at you that if you ever get us integrated, we will die. Here's what she said. This part said, I'm one of 12 disciples. And I've seen this in others, 12 disciples within this hourglass, each of whom had to memorize a disciple lesson, which were basic satanic kind of premises, philosophies of life, like be good to those who hurt you, hate those who are nice to you, on and on and on. There may be two or three sentences like that that associated with each that they had to memorize them. They said, we are like grains of sand falling, and when the last grain of sand falls, there's death. I said, is death a part? Yes, when the last grain of sand falls, the sleeping giant awakens. The sleeping giant was death, who was then to kill them on day one or day six after awakening unless certain things were followed and we did some of those. Well, we also found Death had a sister as a backup, used with mirrors to create the sister part. We had to get past and deal with that too. Death had certain things that they said had to be done to integrate. I started to say, oh, come on, they lied to you before. She said, wait a minute, this what they said you'd say. They said that no doctor would ever believe that they had to go to these extremes to get us well, and that's part of the reason they'd fail. I said, well, tell me. Tell me again. She said, I have to be dressed all in red. I have to have Demerol on board. Have taken Demerol. A code has to be given, and it has to be in a room that's totally dark. It has to happen on day one or day six after this part's been awakened. I said well, what I'd have to lose. I had a psychiatrist give her a little Demerol. We used the code. My office didn't have any windows anyway. It was pretty easy. Oh, and there had to be four, I think, candles lit. Well, fine. So we did it, and everything went well. Maybe it would have gone well if we hadn't done it, but I decided not to take the chance and to trust the patient, maybe. Well, so we go on, and then we find another part. There's death and destruction. Another backup, also with a sister, that we had to get through. In fact, I think there were two backups there. Interestingly, the very last part was an extremely nice part made especially that way so that they wouldn't want to lose them because they would be so adorable and so loving and so sweet that they wouldn't want to maybe get rid of them. Then we found that she continued to have these feelings with this last part left now of darkness and blackness inside. What did we find? A curtain. She said, they assumed that if you ever got to this point you would, and along the way, by the way, we had encountered this stuff about the LSD stuff, the green BOMB program, B-O-M-B. The message was that she said, there is a curtain behind which are the remaining feelings and memories, but it can't be opened from the middle. It's like a stage curtain, has to be opened this way. That it can't be opened, they assumed that you would try to deal with all the feelings that can't be opened until you've dealt with that last part and they've integrated. So far, it looks like we've got integration that's holding. So I found death and destruction and the hourglass in non-bloodline. The tree and the hourglass. 
This patient informed me we're made of sand because we were meant to die. We're expendable. We're the unchosen generation. I've heard variously that it's crystals or blood that fills the hourglass and bloodline people. By the way, you can do real simple things like turn the hourglass on its side so nothing can fall out, so time stands still to be able to do certain kinds of work. Spread the grains of sand on the seashore so that they can't be numbered, and the time will not be counted. Got that idea from a ritual abuse victim who had seen some of this kind of programming done that another therapist was seeing. So those would be just a few other hints about things that may be helpful or meaningful. We're talking about very intense things, and at deep levels to me, this gives us two things. One thing it gives to me is hope because it gets to material and it makes progress like nothing else we've ever seen with these people who have it. The second thing it does for me is it demoralizes me too because although three years ago I had a pretty good idea about the extent and breadth of what they'd done to these victims, I had no real appreciation for the depth and breadth and intensity of what they'd done. I want to come back to the other question over here now. The other question is how many of them can get well? We don't know. In most things in the mental health profession, we accept two-thirds of the patients are going to improve, maybe 70%. There's very little we can get everybody well. I think one of the sad things we have to face is that many of these patients will probably never be well. My personal belief is that if they are being messed with, their only hope of getting well is if they can somehow get out of contact. Now I know patients who have gone to other states and simply had deep level alters pick up the phone and call and said, this is our new address and phone number, so that they could be picked up locally. I mean in an inpatient unit for an extended period of time. If they're in a cult from their area and they're still being monitored and messed with, my own personal opinion is we can't get them well and can't offer more than humanitarian caring and supportiveness. Lots of therapists do not like to hear that. That's my opinion. I believe that if somehow they're lucky enough to be wealthy enough to have protection, to have somehow gotten away in some way, and we can work with them without being messed with, that they have a chance to reach some semblance of normality and livability with enough intensive work. My own personal belief is I don't think anybody with this kind of programming is well in this country yet. There are some who are well along the way. I've got a couple who are well along in their work and have done a tremendous amount, but they're clearly not well yet. Question. Could you speculate on the relationship between this stuff and the fantasy games that have been proliferating, Dungeons and Dragons, and that sort of thing? Well, there are a lot of things out there to cue people. You want to see a great movie, interesting movie to cue people? Go see Trancers 2. You can rent it in your video shop. Came out last fall. One night in sheer desperation for something at the video store, you know, 9 o'clock on Friday night, everything's gone. I rented a couple of movies, and one of them is that. Fascinating. They're talking about Green World Order. Yes, Trancers 2. And who is the production company? Full Moon Productions. I couldn't see much queuing in Trancers 1, but who's the production company in Trancers 1? Alter Productions. There are lots of things around that are queuing. All right, I'm going to stop right there for a second and chime in. He says there are a lot of things queuing. What he's talking about is predictive programming. So... For those of you who have listened to some of my stuff in the past, I am of the opinion that the media is controlled by these same people. They're all part of the same team. So of course they're putting cues, they're putting codes, coded language, coded information, revelation of the method, predictive programming. They are fulfilling their karmic debt, and they're also using media, sound, literature, so many things as a massive MK Ultra operation. All right, now we're jumping back in. There's an interesting person in the late 60s who talked about the Illuminati. Have any of you ever heard of the Illuminati with regard to the cult? Had a patient bring that up to me just about exactly two years ago. We've now had other stuff come out from other patients. Appears to be the name of the international world leadership. There appear to be Illuminati councils in several parts of the world and one internationally. The name of the international leadership of the cult, supposedly. Is this true? Well, I don't know. It's interesting we're getting some people who are trying to work without queuing who are saying some very similar things. There was an old guy in Hollywood in the late 60s who talked about the infiltration of Hollywood by the Illuminati. 
Certainly what some patients have said is all of this spook stuff, horror stuff, possession, and everything else that's been popularized in the last 20 years in Hollywood is in order to soften up the public so that when a satanic world order takes over, everyone will have been desensitized to so many of these things. Plus to continually cue lots of people out there, is that true? Well, I can't definitely tell you that it is. What I can say is I now believe that ritual abuse programming is widespread, is systematic, is very organized from highly esoteric information, which is published nowhere, has not been on any book or talk show that we have found all around this country and at least one foreign country. All right, I'm going to chime in again. Now, this was in 1992, I believe, again, when he spoke this, pre-internet internet was barely in in its public infancy i mean it was military way before internet is a military creation but i will argue the books have been out there zohar talmud greater and lesser keys of solomon the king kabbalah all the judaic literature the jewish mysticism so it has been in front of our faces it's just when you have the Aleister crowley's mathers jet propulsion laboratory NASA, CIA, they're all covers. They're all cutouts. They're all given to us to hide what they actually are. And they're all part of this. He says it's the Illuminati. You can use Trilateral Commission, Council of Foreign Relations, World Economic Forum, BlackRock, Vanguard, all the same stuff, just different puppet faces. And again, I stand by this. If you see their face, they're a puppet. If you see who is actually presenting it to you, they are not the power. So there's a shadow group. I don't think we know who they are. I don't think we'll ever know who they are. And let's jump back in. Let's take a couple of quick questions and we need to get on to other material, yes? Do you have any techniques for decreasing your level of uncertainty that a patient is or is not being still tampered with, messed with, as you said? Doctor. Just that I would ask several of the parts I've inquired about. Core, Diana, Wisdom, Master Programmer. Several parts inside I would ask about these sorts of things and I will keep asking it. As you do additional work and get a bit further, I would ask again to find out. In the back. I wonder if you've heard or you know of the Martin Luther bloodline. The what? Martin Luther bloodline. Doctor. I know nothing about Martin Luther bloodline. I'll give you one quick tip. Ask him about an identification code. There's an identification code that people have. It will involve their birth date. It may involve places where they were programmed and it will usually involve a number in there, like 02 if they were second born. It will usually involve a number that represents the number of generations in the cult if they are bloodlines. I've seen up to 12 now, 12 generations. Question. I've seen a lot of things you've been describing today in several patients. I wanted to ask you a question about the seven systems. You mentioned something about systems here. Are there seven systems? Dr. H. There has been that described in some patients. Yes, the seven systems. Could you say what that is? Or a little diagram? I don't think we know enough to know what it is, honestly. I think it may have to do with seven Kabbalistic trees. Question, have you ever had any evidence where any of these people have been tagged and there have been anything of their body parts that might be related to this private parts in particular? Doctor, well, there are certainly people that have had tattoos that have had a variety of other kinds of things, some of which have been, you know, documented in cases, but I mean to say, well, maybe they did that to themselves or had done it consciously to really prove something, not that occurs to right off the bat. Let me just take this one last question back and we need to go on to other material because we're never going to get through it all. I'll just ask you to hold your question. It's not a question, but I wanted to say for myself personally and perhaps for others here as well, I wanted to thank you very sincerely for taking this time to come forward. Applause. Doctor, well, applause. Does anyone want to join us for standing ovation for this material? It's wonderful. Sustained applause. The doctor. A dear friend who's one of the top people in the field who I know has had death threats, but I know struggled for professional credibility and believing in MPD and was harshly criticized for even believing in that 10 and 15 years ago and struggled to a point of professional credibility. 
I think in his heart of hearts, he knows it's true. But he will say things like, I wouldn't be surprised to find tomorrow it was an international conspiracy, and I wouldn't be surprised to find tomorrow that it was an urban myth and rumor. He tries to stay right on the fence, and the reason is because it's controversial, because there's campaign underway saying these, all the false memories induced by, along with incest and everything else, by Oprah and by books like The Courage to Heal and by naive therapists using hypnosis. It's controversial. My personal opinion has come to be, if they're going to kill me, they're going to kill me. There's going to be an awful lot of information that's been put away that'll go to investigative reporters and multiple investigative agencies if it happens. And an awful lot of people like you, I hope that if I ever have an accident, will be pushing for a very large scale investigation. I think we have to stand up as some kind of moral conscience at some point. I tried to wait until we had gotten enough verification from independent places to have some real confidence that this was widespread. I know we've gone like a house of fire to try to pack as much as I could in for you. I hope it's given you some things to think about and some new ideas, and I appreciate being with you. Long sustained applause. Okay, so we've reached the end. The CIA has a huge campaign running to discredit conspiracy theorists. It's to shut down critical thinking. And that's basically what has been going on in mass in the media right now. Even any controversial thinking, people now check themselves and think, oh, that's, that's conspiracy. I don't care. Question authority. You have to question everything. Question everything. It's hard. It's lonely. It's depressing. You put your mind in some very dark places. But... Apathy is suicide, and I won't bear the blame. Shoot him once.